Welcome to All Right in Sin City, a podcast about writers and writing in the Windsor, Detroit region. Your podcasters today are Irene Moore Davis, author, educator, and local historian, Kim Conklin, Windsor based writer and filmmaker, and me, Sarah Jarvis, former bookseller, publishing rep, and literary festival chair. Our featured author today is George Singleton. George Singleton is a Southern author who has written 10 books of short stories, two novels, an instructional book on writing fiction, and a collection of essays. He was born in Anaheim, California, and raised in Greenwood, South Carolina. In 2011, he was awarded the Hillsdale Award for Fiction by the Fellowship of Southern Writers. Singleton was inducted into the Fellowship of Southern Writers in April 2015, and he was awarded the John William Corrington Award for Literary Excellence in 2016. His latest collection of short fiction is The Curious Lives of Nonprofit Martyrs from Dezank Books in Ann Arbor. Welcome, George. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. It's good to see all three of you. Thank you for joining us. So... So you've written five times as many short story collections as novels. What is it about the short story form that draws you to it? Uh, Probably I'm lazy. That's one. Um, You know, I started off by writing, you know, in college, I started writing this big old manuscript. It was like 450 pages by the time I, about a year after I got out of college. And I I didn't even know how to send anything out. No one, I think my professors were smart not telling me how. And then I took a minor character out of that manuscript and wrote a second novel, a uh, second manuscript. That was about 250 pages. And that stunk also. So then I, and I knew these really were terrible about halfway through, but I'm real hard headed. And I said, I'm going to finish this. And then I took a main character, a minor character out of the second manuscript and wrote a third one. It was 300 pages. Now, meanwhile, I've had a bunch of professors say, write a thousand pages and you're ready. And I was, I'm a lot smarter than that. It isn't going to take me a thousand pages. But if you add up 450, 250 and 300, golly, it comes out to a thousand. Then I started. So this took about eight years, I guess. So then I started writing short stories um, when I started teaching at this small college. And I, I was teaching for, okay, I don't think I've done roofing. I've done a lot of weird jobs. I don't think teaching is the hardest thing in the world. I, you know, I get tired of writers who go, Oh, this teaching's killing me. Oh, come on, go try roofing, pal. Um, so, but I was having to grade a lot. It was just taking a lot of time. So I started writing short stories and I started reading short stories a lot more. And I went, well, this is kind of a lot of fun. And I also think, you know, Randall Jarrell, this poet said, the chances of writing a great poem are the same as being in a lounge chair in your front yard at night and having a meteor fall in your lap. And I, and I always think maybe it is possible to write what I think for me is a really perfect short story. I've never done it, but the chances of me doing that are way beyond my writing a perfect novel. Uh, The first novel I wrote, which was called novel, maybe I've been drinking quite a bit back then. And, you know, I had an editor and an agent. My editor was also the publisher of Harcourt. And he's like, write a novel, write a novel. So he called up one day. He's really nice, named Andre Bernard. And he said, what are you working on? I said, I'm I'm working on a novel. It's called Novel. The main character's name is Novel. And I had written, I was writing a short story called Novel as a joke, but it had gotten about page 40. So that's too long. And he said, he offered me a big advance. This is back when advances, you know, we're back in. 2002 or three um so i had to finish it and and it's kind of a metafictional thing it's not good i was slightly embarrassed about it it either got really good reviews like from the new york times or it got hammered by south carolina newspapers um and then i had another book of stories in between i said i gotta try to write a decent uh novel and i wrote another one called workshops for mad men and I'm happy enough. It's like a B, B minus kind of novel, I guess. And um, But I just like trying to write, the, uh, trying to get everything in that compact little form of 5,000 uh, words or less. It's just more fun for me. And to be quite honest, I get tired of my own voice after about 20 pages. So, you know, that's it. That was a long-winded answer for such an easy question. Sorry there, Kim. 
<laughs> it was a great answer. <laughs> You've talked in the past about setting your fiction in other locales earlier in your career. Then you started to focus on the South. What does the Southern settings and culture give your fiction and what does it offer you as a writer? Question. It makes it easier for me. That first big novel that or manuscript that I wrote took place in Nice, France, because I had spent 10 days in Nice, France when I was in college. The college I went to happened to be Baptist affiliated. And believe it or not, I'm not Baptist affiliated or Christian affiliated or anything affiliated. And the second one took place in Washington, D.C., because I'd spent about six months there. And the third one took place in Memphis. And I'd never even been to Memphis. You know, I just had a map of the place. So then, you know, I was writing stories that took place in you know, Tennessee, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, mostly the Southeast. And then I had an editor named Shannon Ravenel, and she said, why don't you change when she did, it was my second collection of stories, when she did, when Algonquin published that, she said, why don't we put all these in the same town so we kind of have a link, you know? And I said, okay. And in my mind, I had this small town near where I was brought up. The town, the real town is named 96. This is going to get a little bit dirty. I'm sorry. But I said, OK, Shannon, let's now I don't want to call the town 96 because it's a real town. So let's call it 69. And she said, we are not going to call a town 69. So it became 45. And then a lot of my stories after that, a bunch of them were in the town of 45. And then a bunch of them, I keep getting smaller towns. I have to deal with less people and places. Um, one town was called Gruel, G-R-U-E-L. One, I forget that in that novel, Workshops for Madman, I forget the name of that town, but there were only three people living in the town. So it made it a lot easier. Um, but, you know, I kind of know, I know these little places. Um, I didn't know this stuff when I was a younger writer. I thought, what? Yeah, I kept having professors. You know, you're from a small, dying textile town. Why don't you write about that? And I went, well, you know, those are boring. Nothing happens. You got to find exciting places like Windsor, Ontario. So then I read, um, I read, I got it right here, Flannery O'Connor. And I went, oh, this is how to deal with small towns. And, and yes, you know, it's kind of like the smaller the town, the bigger the secret, you know, and that, that helped me a lot. Does that answer it a little bit? Absolutely. Yes. Thank yes. You. Thank you. And those, um, you know, in those small towns, we know, like some of us here have lived in small towns. You're known for your distinctive characters, which have dis been described as obsessive and oddball. How do you create your characters and what makes a good George Singleton character? Yeah, I, I would say they're obsessed. Um, actually, when I think about it, I think good contemporary Southern fiction they're all obsessed about something. You know, a lot of my neighbors here are, are still, some of my neighbors are still obsessed with the Civil War. I'm going, get over it, man. It was a bad, it was a bad, it was wrongheaded in the first place. And it's a good thing we lost, you know, or y'all lost. Um, I think they're obsessed with something. A lot of my characters are, it's like a country song. They're either in a small town thinking, I got to get out of here, it'll be better. Or they've gone elsewhere and went, man, I wish I was back home where I felt more comfortable. You know, there's that. Where it's about people trying to reinvent their their place of being, you know, their uh, station in life and to questionable results. Um, most of my, and you know, most of my, most of my main, most of my, all of my first person narrators are male because I'm not going to try to, I feel, I feel like a fraud enough. So I'd really feel like a fraud if I tried to write from a woman's point of view or anybody who's not of my ethnicity or anything. My male characters usually get their comeuppance in some way. They either think, well, I know how things should be. And then they find out that they're wrong. You know, this is most of how my life goes now that I think about it. Speaking of these characters and what, what their obsessions are, many of your characters in Curious Lives for Nonprofit Martyrs have crazy jobs um just to name a couple of them there's a pre-literary agent and an artist who makes life-size voodoo dolls out of lint from a clothes dryer other characters seem either chronically un underemployed or motivated to avoid work 
How do people relate to work in George Singleton's world and what role does it play in your stories? That's a good question. Um, you know, a lot in this particular um, collection, a lot of them work in nonprofits. And most people who work in nonprofits, I have found, love their work. So that's kind of a different, that's kind of different for me because other play, other stories, most people kind of hate their jobs, you know. The guy, I kind of forgot about that story about the uh, L- Lint. You know, he's got a, he's kind of insane and his wife sends him off so he doesn't scare people all the time. Free literary agent. I thought of that because of probably because of social media. I get so many ads on on social media for I can help you write your novel in, you know, three hours. And I'm going, really? And then you go look up this person has never written a word in his or her life. And and I'm and I think there are people who are kind of suckers for this kind of thing. You know, they will sign up and and it's in a weird way. I think it's sad. I mean, I'm glad that they're um, optimistic. But I think it's just a just wrongheaded, you know. I, I think there are a lot of people out there who kind of take take your money and run. So that pre agent stuff, you know, I'm getting things now. To, you know, I do a lot of blurbs for people, and I do it because people did it for me when I was starting out. So you know, you somebody sends you a novel, yeah, I'll do it ninety percent of the time. Sometimes it's just so bad, and I just don't answer, or or I'll say I can't do it, or if it's self published work, I'll you know, I'll say what my agent one time told me was try to lay off the self-published stuff. It's not going to help you out any. And, um, But I get a lot of people now saying, will you read my manuscript and give it a blurb so I can send it off to agents with your blurb so they know that it might be worth looking, you know, you're looking at. And I go, come on, you know, just get the work done, do it the best you can. If it's worth a damn, the agent's going to take it or the editor's going to take it. Um, so there's that. There just seemed to be a lot of, um, I was working on a story. The last story I was working on was about someone who took it upon himself to go to the grocery store 12 hours a day with a cart and just follow around um, anyone shopping there who might have been Arabic, Muslim, Black, just to kind of go- be a guard for them. Because around here or around anywhere in America right now, there are people getting, you know, threatened, yelled at, punched, shot, you know, for being non-white. And so that I hadn't finished that story, but I have a funny feeling I will, and it'll end up in a giant catastrophe of some, somehow my main character will be arrested. I don't know how. Wow. (laughs) There are also a number of wonderfully wacky nonprofits, as the title suggests, including Cock Rescue, a rooster sanctuary, Cartographers Without Borders, Veterans Against Guns in North America, acronym Vagina, People Opposed to Southern Supremacists Unite Militia, acronym Possum. Why all the crazy nonprofits? What did they represent in this collection? I forgot about Possum. I probably spent more time trying to think up the acronyms than I did actually writing the stories. And when I thought up, I was, I was well into that story with the veteran veterans against guns in North America. I knew about the two characters driving the panel truck with, you know, going to get uh graffiti school desk. I knew about them having a rescue dog in the car. I knew about them going into the diner. I knew about having, I think I borrowed this from a story that I just never finished about three older gentlemen making model airplanes with glue inside of a diner. And then that thing, and I said, well, you know, I'm writing about it. I got to make them some kind of nonprofit. And when I came across, the, it came to me as Veterans Against Guns in North America before I realized what the acronym would be. But when I did figure it out, I hate to say it, I'm not proud, but maybe I did a little dance around the typewriter, um, around the computer and, and went, that's maybe a good one. It's kind of on the edge of being crude and foul, but you know, what the heck? I can't be PC all the time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, taking the whole of your body of work, how does this collection, The Curious Lives of Nonprofit Martyrs, fit into that body of work? Or how do you think it differs? Is it going in a different direction? Uh, well, in a way. Uh, first of all, I think of myself as kind of a one trick pony. You know, I'm telling these stories, they're kind of absurd. You know, I, my the writers that I really liked growing up were not growing up in college. I didn't read growing up because I'm such a small town. There wasn't 
there wasn't even a bookstore there. You know, Donald Barthelme, T.C. Boyle, Thomas Pynchon, those kind of absurdist writers were the ones that that I found myself drawn to. So in a weird way, it's the same old, same old of, you know, main character in an uncomfortable situation and trying to get out of whatever trouble he's gotten himself into. In a different sense, though, I think, and I hope people read that if they've read my other words, some of these are sadder. You know, not all of them are slap your knee funny or they start off kind of funny. And then, I mean, I know this when I go do readings now because people be laughing, 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 and then they'll go, uh oh, maybe I wasn't supposed to be laughing. That's kind of sad. There's a bunch of, uh, there's a dead dog and a, a dead child, or whatever. Um, that, um, is it in this book? The last story in this book's in second person. I've done this in the last two books. And it's about kind of how one becomes a, a nonprofit thing. And he's, and he's, the narrator is listing off all the sadness he or she has seen in his or her life. And I, that was a sad one, I think. Um, actually, I read that one at a book signing and this woman started crying kind of really loudly. I mean, she was kind of bawling and I went, Oh, she just wants some attention, but maybe that's just me. I'll probably write a story about her. In the long run, they're just weird, weird stories of people trying to do the best they can, with, you know, with what they've been given. So what would you say are the biggest challenges and opportunities for writers of Southern fiction today? Well, the challenges and the challenges are the same as it's always been. You just got to write a good story. If you write a good good enough story it will be published i think opportunities right now you know literary fiction it's hard to get in the in the big five you know it's hard to get in hote mifflin or i don't know if, i don't know who the big five are random house um it's easier to write uh some kind of i worked in the trump administration and here's what i saw that's going to get published no matter what so they're going to have to rely on smaller independent presses or university presses I think that's where the good stuff's coming out. I mean, for literary fiction right now, that's where it's coming. I think for me, this will sound like I'm whining. I'm not whining, but old white guy, I've had my time. You know, it's time to get the new generation out there. They have things to say. You know, I'm still writing about slide rules. Uh, I'm not techno. So if somebody writes a story that says something about their iPhone or some app, I don't know what the hell they're talking about. And I'm not going to write that because I don't know what it is, you know. I'm sticking to my slide rule and uh, a yardstick that I'm looking at over there and whatever else, changing the oil in a car. Oh, that's amazing. I just pictured Atticus Finch and his abacus. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Are Dude, you that, now, now I got an image of Boo <laughs> Radley hiding behind that door. I think it's Robert Duvall's birthday today. I think I read that somewhere. Ooh. Usually, and I'm always not in the South when someone says, are you a Southern writer? And I think <laughs> they expect me to be real drunk and just act fool or something. And I don't, I don't even consider myself a writer. So to hell with Southern writer or, but I would have to say, yeah, I live in the South. Yeah. But there's a variety of Southern writers. I am not of the living on the plantation kind of writer of like Faulkner or somebody. I ain't that guy. I'm of the upper lower class lower middle class maybe educated trying to make sense out of things in a town that's kind of falling apart because the cotton mills are gone i'm that kind of southern writer and there are others and then there's appalachian writers who mostly dealing with the mountains like in kentucky tennessee north carolina the the people writing about atlanta who are a little bit um savvier than i am are you working on any new material right now I'm really being slow and I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I spent all those, you know, they always say to writers like, and they always say, you got to write every day, every day. One time I wrote every day for 18 months and didn't place a thing. I mean, zero. And I, and I was writing every day, but I don't know what happened. And now, you know, I'll kind of, I mean, I probably wrote a sentence today, one sentence, but you know, I'm not, I'm not feeling the fire like I did, but I'm old and, I can't, maybe I've said everything I need to say. I don't know. But I always say that. And then somebody will say, oh, shut up. And I just look in and, you know, I got like six short stories coming out. And uh, But some of them were taken 
two years ago. They just haven't come out yet. And I might be working on a novella only because it's gotten a little bit too long and it's too weird. And um, so I'm, I'm writing, but they're shorter pieces. We'd love to hear some of your current work. Would you like uh, to read for our audience? From the book? Yeah. Yes, please. I'm just going to read the beginning of that first story, if that's all right. And the story is called uh, What a Dime Cost. One afternoon, when I might have been 13 years old, my father came home in his paint-splattered truck more than intent. He limp-stomped inside the house. This was summer, and I sat at the kitchen table drinking Kool-Aid sloppily so as to dye my upper lip red. He jerked his thumb toward the door. I looked up scared as I did at least once a day. Did I forget to cut the grass, clean the gutters, wash yesterday's brushes, or let my mother pass out in the lounge chair she set up in the backyard on the edge where she believed we needed a swimming pool? I should mention that my father was a house painter, and if he'd have lived in a time where every student got free psychological tests, he would have certainly been diagnosed with ADD, ADHD, all those others. I doubt another house painter in the South had placed so many of his half-filled gallons of Sherwin-Williams in the back of the truck, forgotten to tamp down the lids, then driven off fast toward home as many times as my father. You could drive all over Draytown and see where my father had been from the streaks of latex that toppled over in the bed of his truck, then drained out the bottom of his tailgate like so much bulldog flues slobber. Traytown homeowners had a thing for light blue and yellow back then. I wasn't much of a sports fan, but I would bet that anyone following a college team with such colors would have felt welcomed in the town of my upbringing. That's right, Draytown. A dray is an old-fashioned word for a squirrel's nest. According to legend, and it's now on Wikipedia because I put it there, some Scottish-Irish settlers came through the area hungry, looked up, got out their muskets or long rifles or slingshots, killed a couple score of fox and gray squirrels, celebrated with a good stew, and then settled. My father kept his thumb pointed toward the carport. I said, what? What did I do? I didn't do anything. You got to come look at this, my father said. I need to teach you a lesson. I licked my upper lip over and over. One time a lesson involved how no one ever trusted a red mustache man or woman. That lecture turned into something about Eric the Red. I'm not sure how he knew about a Viking. And then a guy named Boyt Lott, my mom dated in high school, who had red hair and ended up being a funeral director. I got up out of the gold paisley vinyl back kitchen chair and hopped the one step down into the carport. Did I leave the mailbox door open, forget to pick up the paper, or leave the hose running when I was supposed to spray my mom hourly in her lounge chair so she could feel as if she stood near a waterfall? My father's pickup wasn't dripping paint on the cement driveway, which would make my mother happy enough. If I'd have been a skateboarder back then, I could have practiced on the short vert wall of dried paint like a rubbery multicolored stalagmite that led to the carport. My father said, look in the back what I got today. I peered over the bed's rim and saw 30 box turtles in various realms of distress. Some of them had turned over and wiggled their legs in that internationally understood fauna language of turn me over. Others remained anchored. All of them owned slight blue or yellow paint on their shells. It took some years for me to understand that my father hadn't worked a lick that day, that he'd plane driven the countryside on the lookout for tortoises wishing to cross a two lane. Thank you so much. And yeah. thank you so much, George, for joining us today. It's over already. Oh, man. That was fun. <laughs> no worries. This is like top three of all time Zooms for me. <laughs> well, we're, we're flattered. And it's one of our top three, too. It's been a lot of fun for us, too. Again, yeah. our featured author today is George Singleton. And his latest collection of short fiction is The Curious Lives of Nonprofit Martyrs from Zank Books. In this episode, we want to briefly highlight an upcoming annual event in the Windsor literary community. 
It's the annual book launch evening for the Publishing Practicum program at the University of Windsor. It's a unique educational program where 30 students collaborate each year to edit, publish, and launch a book. This year, the Practicum is publishing two books with Black Moss Press, both poetry anthologies about our local communities. Where the Map Begins explores our roots through the neighborhoods of Windsor. The anthology What Time Can't Touch captures the spirit of Amherstburg through its history. Look for a full episode on the publishing practicum and these two anthologies in the coming weeks on this podcast. If you're looking to hear some talented local poets, the launch celebration for both books will take place on April 2nd at Mackenzie Hall in Windsor starting at 7 p.m. Admission is free. Now we have two selections of the poetry in the books read by their authors. First, we have Peter Hrastovic. He is a Windsor-born University of Windsor Law and Literature grad with three published poetry books, his most recent being There Will Be Fish. Previous books include Sidelines and In Lieu of Flowers. He also contributed to the anthologies Because We Have All Lived Here and In the Middle Space with the University of Windsor Publishing Practicum. He is the current Poet Laureate for the City of Windsor. Peter teaches and practices law. He and his wife Denise have three children and four grandchildren. Now, here's Peter reading his poem, Kanata House, from the Windsor Anthology, Where the Map Begins. This is Peter Rostovic from the forthcoming anthology I will read, Canada House for Canada Dan. You can't miss it. Distinct, iconic, standing on guard at a T-crossing in the heart of the city. Predictably red and white, festooned with flags, maple leaves, indigenous grandeur, and a hockey stick for good measure. A deliberate statement. One patriot's unimpeded vision. This home on native land that bellows, I am Canadian. Loudly, proudly. A unique mix of passion and purpose, a profound declaration to neighbors, passers-by, and the world. The price of freedom is incalculable, and that paint, plywood, and a little labor is far less costly than the erosion of rights, liberty, peace. Like houses, these things require love, attention, and occasional repair. Next, we have Rowan Mustafa, a Palestinian Syrian writer living in Windsor. She received her MA in English and Creative Writing from the University of Windsor. Rowan draws inspiration from social justice causes, and she is particularly impassioned by the struggles and resilience of Palestinians living in exile or under occupation. Now, let's hear Rowan reading her poem, Outside In, from the Amherstburg Anthology, What Time Can't Touch. Outside In In the name of poetry, I enter Honor House. Barbara offers tea, Debbie smiles, Rob unfolds the home. Those who came before set grand windows, pristine portals. They let the outside in. Those who followed planted pillars, expanded the porch. Now the house reaches out. A generational orchestration. I live a moment in its beauty, in the painted landscapes along the walls, in the red oak atmosphere, in the skyward tilt of a telescope. There are so many stories in this house. I pocket a few. The honor is mine. 
Once again, the Publishing Practicum Program launch is April 2nd at 7 p.m. at Mackenzie Hall, and all are welcome. And you'll hear much more about the Publishing Practicum Program and both of this year's books in an upcoming episode of All Right in Sin City. Thanks for joining us. Look for more episodes of All Right in Sin City wherever you listen to podcasts, or check out our website, allrightinsincity.com. For information and announcements of new podcasts, sign up to our email list or follow us on Facebook and Twitter.